excited to be back with you and I'm so excited because today is our first chat with a guest. I'm going to bring him in in just a moment. Before I do that, let me show you our schedule for these chats because they're new. So this is when we're running them. This is in my time zone, which is Dublin time. So make sure that you mark these times in your calendar and that you're ready to go. I'm so excited to see you live on more of these chats. And yeah, hopefully the timing will work out for you guys. If you are not a member of Vibrant Music Teaching, you can also get access right now with our special coupon code. So I want to let you know about that in case you need resources for your online lessons before we kick off here. That is the coupon code online and you can sign up at vibrantmusicteaching.com. Now, make sure to add your questions as we work through here. I see lots of people are already live and joining in with us, so add in your questions as we work through here. My special guest today is Tony Parla Piano, and yes, that is his actual genuine name. He has piano in his name, which is just, I'm so jealous of that. But Tony is an absolute superstar when it comes to teaching pop music. So that's what we're going to be diving into today. He's also been teaching online for a lot longer than most of us, so I'm sure he's going to have some tips to share with us there. So let's give a big warm welcome to Tony. Hi, Tony. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm delighted to have you here. First of all, I'd love it if you could give us just a quick overview of like, how does your studio look? Well, first of all, whereabouts are you for people that don't know you? And how does your studio look? What's the kind of makeup in terms of ages and online versus usually offline, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I, um, well, I'm from Massachusetts in the United States, so uh, over on the East Coast. And um, my studio, um, I've been running it for uh, about probably about 17, 17, 18 years. And it kind of all started by accident. Um, I was, I was going to school and working at a, a kind of like a mom and pop music shop. And, uh, I was, I was like selling musical instruments and, and one of the, one of the customers who came in asked if I taught piano after I had sold her one. And then she kind of just spread my name around. And, um, so at that time I started as a, as a travel teacher and then, um, they opened up a second location and I got kind of my start there doing, um, teaching in, in a, in a store environment. And then I, and then from a few years later, I kind of broke off from that and just, um, did my own thing, which was primarily travel teaching. And then the year that, um, Apple introduced FaceTime, I had a student that was going to off to college and he had just gotten an iPad and his mother thought it would be a good idea to, to see if we could try to keep it going. So, um, I've, um, I've been I've been teaching online, you know, a little bit since for that long since uh since that that was about 10 years ago. And throughout that time I had been teaching, you know, um still most of my studio was in-person lessons, but I usually only would have like 3 to 5 students um online and so now uh now we're all full-time online, so now it's um they're, they're all there, so 35 to 40 students a week. And um it's a it's a big makeup. Um I I have students that are um, I actually have one that's that's three years old, <laughs> but she's um, typically typically I work with students that are age six and up for, you know, the three year old is kind of like the six year old has like a full time slot and she takes like a 10 minute lesson just to feel included. Um, and uh, and um, and then, you know, I, my oldest student is 78 and she just started, you know, four or five years ago. So it's um it's pretty wide range. And um I don't do a whole lot of marketing. It's a, it's it's um it's all it's been pretty much all word of mouth. So um I um I really enjoy just tapping into each student's interest and just you know wherever they want to go. So if it's um you know it's it's a it, I would say I have about 35 to 40 students, mixed range of age. Um it'll probably go back to mostly travel teaching once this is done, but who knows? I you know, I, depending on how long this goes, I'm really enjoying this um teaching online much more than I thought I would. What have you found to be the best about it? Because I know a lot of teachers who travel teach actually don't love it, but you seem to really like going to students' houses and having that variety. So what do you like in the contrast with, with uh, online lessons? Well, um, so yeah, it, that's true. A lot of people who, who do travel teaching, and that's, um, you know, they don't love it. It's the way that they kind of get started with it. 
for me, I, I need, I, I like being in a different space. I like, you know, observing the student's instrument. I like, I like, I like, you know, saying, Hey, the tuner is going to come next week. <laughs> Cause it, it was, it was surprising to me. Like this whole flip, it's like so many teachers were like, I can't believe the instruments that my students, it's like, you don't need to be a travel teacher to have a conversation with a parent about like what, what the instrument is that oh, they're yeah, using. But you know, they lie, Tony. That's the truth. They lie. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if you're not going to, and I used to travel teach as well. And so yeah. there is a difference. Like they, they lie or they're sort of oblivious or they're not really listening to you. Like you explain right. about what a weighted key is and they say, Oh yeah, yeah that's what we have. Yeah. 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 And yeah, yeah. That's not what they have. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that does make sense. But like, for me, I just, I, um, I like, like, cause I'll, I'll notice things about the environment too, where, um, you know, it's, I, I'll work with siblings and I'll notice one can work, you, you know, there could be a party going on in the next room and they're totally focused. And then another one, like a pin drops and they're distracted. And so things like that are, are helpful to know, to, like, to tell, tell the parents, you know, when they're practicing, try to make sure, you know, cause they get very easily distracted. Um, but, um, yeah, so, um, Jeez, I, I, I just strayed off the, the, the original question that you asked. <laughs> no, <it> was <laughs> what was that? It was an interesting tangent. It was about what you actually enjoy about the online lessons. Oh, so, so with travel teaching, um, I, you know, I'm, I try to be a minimalist in terms of what I carry with me. So I have like this backpack that's, that needs to be perfectly organized and like I have to have all my, my items <laughs> ready to go. Um, but I don't travel with a lot of stuff. So to me, it's I um, I have almost everything I need um, in my Dropbox, so I can access it from an iPad, which is great. But the thing that I really love about the online teaching is I have um, I don't have like a, a a really advanced setup, but it's it's advanced enough where I can share my screen, I can share my iPad, I can we can listen to recordings together. There is a little you know there's a novelty to it too, like a, a little bit of excitement of just trying something new. And finding new ways to communicate, I think it's making me a better teacher because I have to be really clear with my instructions. Mm. Um, I I definitely I find myself talking more, like trying to explain things before. I you know where in a in a lesson I try to like disappear and just listen for questions mm. and and wait for questions to come. Where here I feel like I'm 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 maybe over explaining things because I just want to make sure I'm really clear, but. Um, it's it's starting to um, it's starting to balance out now that it's been going on for whatever five six weeks or so, um, but I I just I love that I have the ability to share so much on the screen and that I can you know I don't have to ask them to get up from the bench and me demonstrate something it's yeah. like I can just demonstrate it right here and then they can they can do it and um, but I think that's probably um, you know I have the whole like I get the light up keyboard and the and I you know I have I have. I have, um, you know, some software programs where if I play the notes, they'll show up on a staff right there so they can, um, you know, chord analyzers, things like that. So I just, I'm, I'm able to include a little bit more of the technology, which is, you know, it's just, I think if I, um, I don't know that I would love it as much if, if I didn't have some of those toys to play with. But, um, <laughs> but I, I will say that I spent like the first seven years of teaching online with just FaceTime and just a single camera view and it worked out just fine. So um, I, I would, I would learn to adapt to that too. I don't think anybody needs like a really fancy setup because we're still, we're still in the relationship business. This is all about communication. And, um, and I've been just enjoying, I'm finding that it's making me more creative and in, in my approach and I'm trying different things. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come in and just like pick up where we left off. I'm like, yeah. everything's different. So we're going to try some new stuff. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Not just trying to sort of have a shadow of of what an an in person lesson would have looked like, but actually doing something special and different. Exactly. I see a lot of people joining us in the chat there. Hi to Sherry and Faye and Carrie and Linda and Joy. It's awesome to have you here. Let us know if you have questions for Tony or for me as we work through here. Um, I wanted to talk to you, Tony, about something you mentioned on your website, which is that you talk about being interest-led, being an interest-led student, a studio, um, and that that's your main focus. So what does that mean to you to be interest-led? Yeah, um, and I, I kind of pair that with like interest-led learning and student-directed teaching for the most part. So where um, I, I really, for the most part, I, 
I'm very focused on teaching concepts. And so I, I don't really, it doesn't matter what the material is. You can hand me any method book and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to strip away, <laughs> you know, the approach that they have in there. And I'm just going to use the material to teach it the way that, that I would want to. Um, but when it comes to interest led learning is just making sure that whatever the students are working on, it's, it's something that they care deeply about. And, um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that I won't ever use, um, traditional method books or, or things like that, but it just means that I'm always tuning in and checking in that students are working on things that bring them joy, uh, make them happy. And, uh, and I want to make sure that they understand that they have a voice and a lot of control over the direction of their lessons. Um, so with the approach that I take, um, I, I can, I can really introduce songs that I think sometimes people think you have to wait years in order to, you know, oh, well, we can't get to that till later. But because the basis for my, for my teaching is, you know, I start with the ears, the mind, and then the eyes. Um, I can, I can teach a lot of stuff that they wouldn't be able to read for many years, but they'll, they'll, they'll get into it. And I, and I can still hold that to a high standard um, of, of learning. So it's not just, hey, repeat after me or copy what I'm doing, but it's, it's, um, it's a little more structure based. So that's, that's the interest led learning part is just um, letting them have a lot of control over the whole process because um, over choosing the material and also how the lesson kind of unfolds. Mm -hmm. Um, like, what would you like to start with today? Um, making sure they feel comfortable, you know, what's, what's, you know, you know, show me something that, you know, show me something that you, you did this week that I didn't teach you, you know, like, cause I try to encourage them, you know, in inspire curiosity and, and to explore the instrument on their own or picking out a melody from a, you know, a, a television program that they like or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I mean by that. Yeah. Nice. Melissa said in the chat, student led learning is fun. And Tony is amazing. <laughs> Which is oh, great. hey, Melissa. <laughs> Good to have that feedback. Yeah. Um, so is this idea of interest led learning, I'm guessing that's how you got into, maybe not, but that's how maybe you got into the whole area of teaching pop music and that kind of focus. Is that coming from your students and what they wanted to learn? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, I, I don't, I didn't have like the, I don't have the typical story of a piano teacher. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have lessons as a child. Um, I didn't start playing piano until I was in college. And so when, when I started, you know, I, I was, I, I grew up through like the band program and things like that, but I never had like traditional classical lessons, um, or anything like that. So when I got started, I really started playing with a lot of my friends who are singer songwriters, you know, in the pop rock kind of genre. So that is really the foundation. So I don't, I, I'm not like teaching pop isn't like a consolation prize for me. It's like, yeah. I want to be doing this other thing. And I, and, and I have, but I genuinely love the genre and that's, that's, that's how I started. Mm -hmm. So really for me, what happened was I, I started by thinking, I'm like, I need to go, you know, teach this other way. Cause I, you know, we all have to start somewhere. So, you know, I, I, I thoroughly researched both of the method books that were on the shelf at the store that I was teaching at. <laughs> and I picked one and I started with it. And like, you know, within like by the second lesson, you're like, well, why didn't you practice? Um, <laughs> so, and, and, and then um, I would always notice things where it would be like, if I gave them, if they said, oh, I really want to learn this thing. And I would just like, I would sketch out something, you know, and I knew they couldn't read it. So I would write it out in some like non-traditional notation format like I would just write something out and they come back the next week and they'd have that nailed it's like they perfect perfect timing for like I'm like how come you did that so well but you didn't do this and he said well I like that so I was like so that's that's that where the interest led, you know every, <laughs> everything stems from interest so if I can find a way to do that and um you know it 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 took a while it wasn't it wasn't like I was always really comfortable doing it um right away but I've gotten to the point where it's become such a natural part of the, the rhythm of my lessons where it's like you know if the student wants to show me a song I've never heard before like 30 seconds later we're, we're figuring it out together and um, and I know how to lead them through that process and that's that's very exciting because it's not just like magic it's not like it's, it's already it's already there all the notes are there it's like we got to figure this out together right. and then we get to make decisions together about like how are we going to do that so you know, it might start with just two voices, you know, it's, we're just going to do the melody line and we're just going to do a single note bass line and we're going to hear those outside voices and then we're going to discuss how we're going to fill it in. So it, it, it all depends. You can really, you can really strip a song down to the basic essential elements 
and um, it's not really that much more challenging sometimes than than what they're than what they're already trying to do from written music in, inside a method book. Right, especially if you take away the written element. Like some of that is so focused on the reading factor mm -hmm. that the music is <laughs> stripped out of it. Well, and I think for myself, because um, I, I don't I don't want to. Um, I, I want to be careful not to say that I, 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 it's not that I don't think that, that reading is important because mm -hmm. I, I, I do. I think um, I want for myself, that's never been the primary way that I've received information, but I, I, I want for all my students, um, I want to make sure that the written music is always useful to them, even if they're going to take it and do their own thing with it. So for me, the way that I got better at reading was through writing. And so that's what I like to do with my students mm -hmm. is, um, is, is have them, you know, and I, and I have to say that, you know, I, I'll see teachers sometimes say, um, yeah, we're in, we're in level 2B and like we're having really, you know, a hard time still in, in middle C position or something. And, and it's just like, well, how did they get to that point? Yeah. And, um, and they're trying to figure out a way to like, like, and I just, I know for myself, I've never come across like an issue with reading that couldn't be like worked out through writing. Because right. you just, you hand them the pencil, you say, hey, can you, can you write this out? And then you see where the, the the misunderstanding will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much comes up that way. Like I find that through all of the composing projects I do, especially that mm -hmm. you suddenly twig something. If you mm -hmm. don't do them often enough, if there's a gap, you you do that composing project with a student, and then you realize, oh right, they've completely misunderstood what a ledger line is or something. <laughs> Because exactly. you see them trying to work it out, and it it's just not making any sense. They're, the structure yeah. behind what they're trying to do. Yeah, and the staff's going up and down. The piano's going left and right. Yeah. So sometimes there's even a, a, a mis misunderstanding there. For sure. Yeah. Well, which way? Which way is higher? You know, this is going. You know, so I've I've even come across that, and so it's I. You know, I. Sometimes I'm just mystified, and I have no idea. Like I'm like how? Like so? That's the only way that that's the only. Uh, certain way that I've ever come across, like, okay, here's the pencil. Can you draw me a middle C? Okay, you understand that. Now, can you draw me an E? Right. Okay, you get, you see this. So it, it, that works pretty much every time. But just trying to explain it, um, and that's that's where it comes to the other thing. Is I tell my students, I say, you need to ask more questions. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, like that's how you learn. You know, just because I always end every lesson with that. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? They always say no. I'm like, you need to have more questions. I said, you're not going to learn just by listening to everything I want to tell you. Like, right. you know, so I, I try to encourage that as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, that sounds like a similar approach to how I use games in order to teach students. Because once they get into the game, they're going to have to ask questions to make it yes. work. So it's the same kind of branching out from the music so that you can understand how they're perceiving the music itself, the written music. So... You wrote a great guest post for us recently, Tony, which was fantastic. Teachers are loving reading that. Uh, and one of the things I loved about it was how step by step, how much you broke down the steps so that people could actually understand this is how we get here and this is how we get there. Yep. So I was curious if you could tell us if a student came to you, let's say they're 10 years old and they come to you and they say, I just want to learn pop music. I just want to write. That's their whole thing. They want to play yeah. cool music for their friends. What is the very first thing you might teach that student at the first lesson? I know it might vary depending on their interest, but what's some, if they don't know specifically what they want to learn, what might you teach them? Um, well, there's, there's a couple things. Um, one would be pretty difficult to probably explain in, okay. in, 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 in words, so I'll, I'll kind of skip to the second one, which is probably more kind of stage two. Um, the I, I will just mention the first one is more about kind of like navigating the piano and just understanding the layout of the piano. Like I like to break up the piano into into units um, where I, I kind of discuss, you know, from C to E with the black keys, that's unit one. And this this other, um, you know, from from F to B with the black keys, that's unit two. And then I have like these series of steps, these creative steps where I say, OK, I just want you to hit. The first, they don't even need to know it to see. I just want you to hit the first note in unit one all the way up the piano. How many of them do you have? Mm -hmm. You know, and they find that they have eight C's. And so I'll say, okay, now I want you to start on C3. So they have to find C3 on the piano. And I say, I want you to play C and F. So the first note in each unit all the way up the piano. So they're, and I say, now I want you to add a G, you know, and, and hold the pedal down. And then they go all the way up the piano and they're making a C sus four chord. And it sounds really cool. 
and I say, okay, um, now I want you to go all the way up the piano, and on the way back, I want you to come down, I want you to add an E on the way down, so you hear that like resolution. And so they're, they're now just holding the pedal and just using, you know, three fingers. They're creating this beautiful sound and using the full range of the instrument and starting to understand location and how um, they, can, they, can, they can navigate the piano. But another exercise that I like to do once I get beyond that, you know, as anybody who's read the article knows that I like to teach students to think and hear in numbers. Mm-hmm. And the main, main reason behind that is because it's um, – a student could, could get used to playing a chord progression in terms of letters. You know, um, that's one of the things I spoke about in there is like they could play a C, a G, an A minor, and an F chord without really having the awareness that they're playing a one to a five to a six to a four. So that when they go to another song in another key, they might not recognize that, that same pattern just because it's different letters and they're, they, they, they haven't made that connection. So when I, when I start, I like to, explain that, that, that scale in terms of numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then, you know, I'll, I want them to feel that pull. Like when you hit that seven, you're going to have a really strong pull to want to come into the next octave. So I'll have them, I'll have them do things like that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, pull it into the next octave. So it's like, br- bring it up, bring it in, and then have them feel that and get that number system. So I, um, I know some people will call that eight. I, I usually put that in as one with a little parenthesis. I call that the repeater because that's when the process starts over. And so I, I have an exercise that I call, um, I actually call it area 51. <laughs> and um, so what I have them do is in the right hand, I have them play the five and the one. So if we're in the key of C, they'll play a, a, a G and a C. And they'll just play like a quarter note rhythmic pattern there doing it. And I'll have them in the left hand, I'll have them focus on the bass, which a lot of methods don't start with a lot of focus on the bass, it's mo- it, but that is the most useful, you know, voice in terms of figuring out the harmony of a song. So I like to focus on that. So I, I have them start with the five and the one, and then I have them in the left hand. I have them just play it with every number: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they're they're hitting that, and so they're getting the sound. And the nice thing about that is the properties of five and one. They're like they they work. They blend well with all the tones. And so from there, I have. Um, like a, a sequence, I have five sequence progressions, five sequence number systems, um, or five sequence progressions. So two of them are spoken about in that article, which is the primary chord scale, and then that, that phone number rhythm thing, the one, three, six, two, four, five, seven, which is more about understanding the groupings of which numbers come, um, which chords go with which numbers. But I have actually five sequence progressions that are in that. And so this is the way that I kind of teach that in the beginning because it gets them familiar with those chords, but it takes out the whole full chord concept. So as long as they can play two notes in the right hand, you can play that same progression, one, five, six, four, um, in the left hand, you can play that bass motion with just the 51 and in the right hand, the five and the one, and you will still feel, you will still feel all those chord progressions without having the full range. So that's what I might start with. And, you know, um, between those two exercises, um, you know, as far as the, the creative part where I have them improvising with using just those four notes, um, they can feel confident after one lesson. Like mm-hmm. if they see a piano, it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go play that piano right now. You know, I, I, I'll you know, just feel confident going and approaching an instrument and creating beautiful sounds. And so, like I said, the Area 51 is, an, is, a, is another good, good one to kind of get that, those chord movements and um, you can get them playing a lot of songs right away without having to move their right hand very much. And, and that really helps them hear the bass movement. Yes, fantastic. We had a question from Re there the, about the article that we're talking about. So that is on the Colorful Keys blog. It's close to the top because we just published it recently. So if you just go to colorfulkeys.com, you'll get there as colorful with two U's because I'm on this side of the Atlantic and that's the camp we're in. So colorfulkeys.com. Now, um, so in this idea of teaching pop music, Tony, there's two issues that come up. One is how can we get students, how can we decide which pop songs we want to teach our students? As in, if a student won't tell you <laughs> what they want to <laughs> yeah. learn, do you have any students like that? Um, I, a few. A few who are like yeah. a bit nervous or maybe embarrassed somehow to tell you what their actual interests are. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm usually able to get it out of them. Um, you know, sometimes I'll be like, you know, well, do you listen to music? Like, 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 how do you listen to music? Do you have Pandora account? Do you have Spotify? Do you 
listen to your parents' records, like somewhere music is, is, is in their life, you know? And if it's not through pop music or radio, like maybe it's in a video game or maybe it's in a soundtrack to a movie or their favorite television theme, so, uh, uh, theme song. So I, it's just trying to pull that out and figure out where it is. But if um, like students, I, I do have that, you know, they don't know what they want to do. I said, go get your phone, you know, like go get your phone, bring it over here. Like, there's a recently played tab in, in your, in your, in your thing. Let's go listen to what you've been listening to. And, and um I'm I'm perfectly fine giving suggestions. I just find that when it comes from them, yeah. then it's um, then it just it, it always works out better. They don't they typically don't get bored of it. I do want to make sure they're a little more invested than just knowing the song title though. Like so, they'll say like, "Yeah, I want to learn the song." I say, "Who wrote it?" Yeah. Or at least who performed it, right? Okay. The um, and if they don't know, I'm like that's so lame. Go figure it out. Like, don't tell me you want to learn a song that like, you don't even know who sings it. Like go, go learn a little bit more about it. You know, if it's not like something immediately from today, can you tell me what year it was from? You know, where did you hear this song? What does it make you think of? How does it make you feel? Because that's one of the things I talk about. That's the, what I love about teaching pop music is that, and um, I mention this almost every time I talk about it. It's, it's, there's such an emotional connection to that music where it reminds us of, you know, favorite moments. Like I can think, I can hear a song from the nineties and just I'm instantly I'm back in high school. It's like, I remember exactly where I was when I heard that song for the first time. And so they can kind of preserve these memories that we have. And in the same way that when you are able to take a song like that, that a student really loves and then teach them concepts, it really protects the learning experience so that it it never leaves the student. And somehow it, it, it makes it really memorable for me too, because We'll, you know, six months later, we'll be learning another song. I'm like, hey, do you remember that that song that we did? This is the same thing, same thing going on over here. And um, so even though I'm, I, you know, people, how do you keep track of all of it? And I'm like, I don't know, but it's just, it's somehow like music just creates and preserves memories. And whether it's it's something that I'm just listening to or whether I'm working on it with a student, it's like I can recall, I, 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 I send messages to students I've had 10 years ago. I'm like, oh, I just heard this song. I said, remember when we did this together? Yeah. You know, and like, because, you know, now that we have all the social media, it's like I'm still connected with all these students that, that you know, that I started with when they were teenagers and now they're, you know, in their 20s. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, it's cool. It's like I, I just, that, that's, the, that's the part of it that I love. Yeah. But um, as far as if they don't if they don't have an interest if they can't explain anything then I'll just pick something, and 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 then they'll then they'll learn that they they should probably pick something. <laughs> <laughs> what do you pick? Um, well, I for the most part it, it might not necessarily be a song at that point. What I'll do is I'll I'll usually use more of like a creative assignment. I'll say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna play with these chords. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have an activity where we we play with sus chords today. So I'll, I'll give them a standard progression, maybe something as simple as a one, four, five progression. And I say, okay, we're going to do that, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to use sus chords with all those and just get used to that sound. Um, Cause I don't want to get them invested in a song that they haven't chosen. I'd rather at that point, just go into like a, a you know, a, a theoretical concept or, or, so, or something like that and, 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 and do something where, It'll still be fun. They'll still make cool sounds. It'll be something useful, possibly to them in the next song that we do. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wrap them up in like a, a project for four weeks. That just becomes kind of their homework assignment. It's like, well, you didn't have something today. You gotta have something by next week. Right, right. Yeah. So, do you generally approach pop songs when they do come up with them, whatever they are? Are you generally approaching them by ear, getting students to figure out melody, baseline, maybe fill in from there? Yeah, well, and again, it, it depends on, on um, you know, it's, you know, it's the stock answer to everything, right? It depends on the student. Yeah. Everybody's different. <laughs> but, um, but generally, yeah, generally it, it is, I try to go from, you know, it's an activity that I call like radio to piano, you know. It's, it, we want to go from the recording. And so it's just a matter of how much assistance I need to give them. Um, and if, um, you know, so a, a student who might be more advanced will say, okay, well, this song has got four chords. These are the numbers, but you need to figure out the order. You know, mm-hmm. um, I'll say it starts on a one chord and then it goes to these other three numbers, but like you need to figure out the order. Can you listen for it? And you just help guide them. Um, a lot of times it starts by just identifying the key. You know, I say, well, what key is this in? They say, I don't know. I said, we'll hit a note. Nope, that's not in it. Yeah. Nope, that's not in it either. You know, oh, that one sounds good. And, um, 
so kind of helping them kind of find their way to navigating that. But I will use, um, like I have a sheet music direct pass thing where it's like 10 bucks a month and I can like, I, I, we can view anything, any, any of the sheet music on there. And then I get like 50% off print. So sometimes I'll go in and if, um, I'll grab them a lead sheet from there, or maybe we'll, maybe we'll grab a piano arrangement and then we'll just change the whole thing. Yeah. Um, cause I'll be honest, I've, I've, I rarely come across, I really, I rarely come across a piano arrangement, a popular piano arrangement that I want to use exactly as it's written. Yeah. Um, like almost never. And, um, I, I want, I, so I, I almost always have to change that. So I, I prefer to work from a lead sheet if possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah. I think it's more valuable to students that way anyway. Like yep. doing an actual distinct activity versus kind of do, using the sheet music but not really. Or using the sheet music with fidelity and it sounding nothing like the actual song and not being particularly <laughs> enjoyable for the student and you didn't get that motivation that you wanted, you know, from them learning something that they'd love to learn. Um, we've had a few questions in the chat about parents so I was curious, Tony, about your online lessons or your lessons in general. Do you involve parents in general? Do you have parents in the room? Um, not really, but it's not it's not because I don't want them there um, or anything like that. I, I I it's it's um it's really interesting. I almost like I think you know I, mentioning I'm a traveling teacher. <laughs> Um, I think just the experience sometimes and, and the, the connections with the family are a little bit different. You know, it's, you, you go into the home and it's not just a, um, it's not just a piano lesson. It's like, like you're their, they're, you're their company after a long day. And sometimes the parents just want to chat about other things and you get to know the whole family and interact. But I, I rarely even get questions about the progress. And I, I hope that's just because they can hear it in the results of the right. students and they're like, oh yeah, things are going good. Um, you know, and I'll certainly bring things up if I need to. But, um, you know, it's usually more like, hey, what's going on this weekend? <laughs> and so they, they don't get too involved. But I, I will say that, um, you know, that Area 51 exercise that I, that I, that I do with the students, um, when I have them do those sequences and then I have them break from that and kind of create their own pattern, sometimes I'll, right from the beginning, I'll say, hey, you know, bring in the parent. I say, come, come, come in here. And I said, all right, I want you to, I want you to you're, you're going to play together. And so by like the second or third lesson, they're, they're playing with their child and creating music. And it could be just, you know, you're just going to use your second finger and you're going to hit white keys while, you're, while your kid's keeping this rhythm. Oh, and it just, and, and it's just, they feel that connection because I realize now it's, um, for my, most of my parents, what I've noticed is the only thing that they care about is whether their kids are having fun or not. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like if their kids are having fun, we will continue. If they are not having fun, we will stop. And um, I realized that one day after I sent a parent a beautiful message about just how how wonderful her son was doing. Um, There's no agenda behind it. I was just I just left the lesson. It felt really great, and and he was working really hard. And and that was that was the response I got back was like, yeah, he says he's having fun. <laughs> right. I was just, just like that's 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 all they care about because they don't know. They really don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, unless they're involved in it themselves. So. Yeah. No, that's absolutely 100% what most parents actually want is, yep. yes, they want to see progress coming through and you will get that occasional pushy parent who who wants more updates on progress or, you know, teachers have been mentioning in the chat about them getting kind of in the way of what's going on or being a second teacher. Totally. And I would rather a student get it all wrong and come back with questions. Right than to have like a parent like standing over them telling them when to practice and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm very like, like even with the practice thing, you know, I don't, I don't give like, you need to do it five days a week for X number of minutes or anything like that. And I say like this, you just need to include piano as part of the rhythm of your life. Right. Like I just want you connecting with the instrument. I don't even really care if you're playing what we worked on last week, as long as you're coming and engaging with the instrument, there's learning happening. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I come back and you haven't touched the piano all week, like, well, there's obviously, there's clearly an issue with the interest, right? So that's where, you know, otherwise you would have done it, right? It would have been more important than the video game you wanted to play and things like that. And, and I know we compete with a lot of things, yeah. a lot of activities and things like that. And, um, and there's not necessarily, I, I think structure sometimes needs, you know, it needs to be there. So 
I just, I don't start with that, but sometimes if, if, if it doesn't happen on its own, if I can't get there through interest alone and just making it so fun that they want to go to the piano, then, then yeah, then we have to talk about it. It's like, well, what would be a good time? Is there a consistent time that we can do this? And the two things that I ask for parents, these are the only two things I ever want from them. Tell your child you love listening to them play. Mm -hmm. I forgot what the other one was. <laughs> but that's a very important one, so I can take up both slots if you like. <laughs> yeah, uh, just just tell your child you love listening to them play. Um, I had another one. It's like, um, but um, I, I kind of forgot what it was. But just oh, the other thing is just making sure that they have that the time and the space in their schedule to actually do this. Yeah. Because, you know, if piano is like the seventh thing on their list of activities that they care about, then like at that point, we're just a luxury. A YouTube teacher will be fine. Like just, just, just go to YouTube and watch the tutorial and just figure out your favorite pop song. Because that is, at that point, it's like you're not going to get students coming in wanting to study the instrument. They just, they just want to learn that, that cool pop song. And I'll do that. I'll, I, you know, I have students like that and they'll go sideways for like a year, you know, for, but um. And as long as it's an enjoyable experience, like the student's pleasant and they're, you know, um, like I, I can, I can do that and, and kind of just test out like new kind of strategies with them. And, you know, in the lesson, how effective can this be with a student who never touches the piano? Um, Melissa suggested that your second one should be pay on time. I don't think that's what Tony was going for. <laughs> that's definitely I, yeah, important I, I, as well. <laughs> The, um, I will say that like I'm I'm grateful now that I have like um I, I'm 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 um I never really had much of an issue with that but I was also never I never really had like strict super strict policies about that but now I have it all set up I use uh, I use a service called Fonz and it's all it's all automatically you know and when I set that up I have I don't have you know, I, I have probably like 65% of my business running through that. And the rest of them are all people who are already paid on time anyway. Yeah. So as soon as I got that, I was like, Hey, like you, you need to go on this because <laughs> you're, you're making me send you reminders. I don't want to send reminders. I don't want to spend my time doing this. Right, right. But, uh, you know, if, for the people that were paying on time, like I just told them, I said, Hey, if you want to do this, you can otherwise just keep, keep writing the check. Yeah. Awesome. Lynn said, I love that quote, include piano in the rhythm of your life. I really like that as well. It's a nice way to put it. Yep. We had one more question in a different direction, and I think we'll sure. wrap it up there, which is, um, my students do much better when the parent... Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. This was about improv, where is it? Yes, this one, from Linda. I've been doing simple improvising with chord progressions with my students, but they are so inhibited. They do very little movement or rhythm. How to help with this? So, for those students who... Really, you can't break them out of their shell? Have you ever come across that, Tony? Or do you find that because you start so much away from the page from the beginning that that doesn't come up? Um, I, yeah, I, I would say that it, it doesn't... You, you have to maybe kind of figure out, well, why, why is that happening? Why are they... You know, is it... Um, for me, ground zero, when, when I'm teaching chords, I have like this, like... This, this way of doing because most most students if they're wanting to learn just chords I mean there's two styles they're either going to be playing for vocal accompaniment because they want to they want to sing mm -hmm. or some students do want to create like a solo piano arrangement that includes the melody so if you're talking more about just playing chords because they want to sing along or they want to do it for a friend who wants to sing along then I start with ground zero which is we, we start with just the chords and I do just long tones I don't include rhythm at that point mm -hmm. and for the most part, I don't even I don't want them to even think about rhythm or timing or anything. All I want them to do is visualize the movement. So if we're going from a C chord to an F chord, and we're not just doing root positions, like we're thinking about inversions and holding common tones in place, um, then I just want them to visualize and say, wait till you're ready, and then move, and then back, and then move, and back, and then work through the chord progression like that. Once they can get through that, stage two would be, now let's, let's do the long tones, but in time. Mm -hmm. And then the, the next phase after that would be implementing some type of basic rhythmic pattern, such as maybe just quarter notes in the right hand with the long tones in the left hand, and then maybe throwing in a little rhythm. So it's just like with reading music, you have to introduce everything in, in a graded process and something that's achievable. So, you know, just changing one thing each time that they do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not certain if that, really answers the question but sometimes if you just say things like 
if you tell a student, hey, just make something up, you know, on the piano, it's like, right. that's really intimidating. You're like, what, what do you mean just make something up? Even just telling a kid, like, hey, use all the black keys, you know, just make something up. You know, even if you strip it down to that, that's still kind of hard. You know, sometimes they're, they're not sure what to do. Yeah. And I, but if you say, hey, just create a rhythm with this one note. <laughs> start, start with one note. Okay, now we're going to add two notes. Now we're going to do three notes. And um, really finding a place where they will feel comfortable trying something. Um, so maybe I'll play a chord progression and say, okay, you're going to improvise on just the note C. But you can use all the Cs on the piano. You know, as long as you're not interfering with what I'm doing down here. So, like, you can hit this C, this C, this C, this C, this C, and, and then kind of bounce around. It's like, okay, now use your C and your F, or what, what, however you want to do it. You just have to find a way that the most likely scenario is that they're intimidated, and they think it's going to sound bad. Yeah. So you need to give them options that are going to sound good all the time. And maybe you need to show them that in, in advance. Like, everything I'm playing down here is going to make it so whatever you do up here is going to sound good. So don't worry about it. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. It's about giving, reining it in, whether you're talking about a chord pattern or like free form improvising or whatever you're trying to do with them, Linda. It's about actually giving them parameters, walls yep. around what they're doing so that they can be creative within that. Don't think of that as being not creative. Even right. if you're giving them a little rhythmic riff and just asking them to choose which note they play it on, sometimes students need that as a sort of comfort blanket to get used to it. And yep. also be aware that improvising, when you're improvising, Linda, or anyone experienced with this is, they're not actually just making stuff up on the fly. Everyone has these little riffs and these little patterns that they come back to. So it's not all completely coming from nowhere. And it's fine to be giving your students little prompts and giving them guardrails to help them navigate that and be creative within the safety of that. Yeah, and that's all part of the organic process is when, when, you're, when you're doing that and you're exactly right, it's not, it's not just over time, you know what it's going to sound like before, you, before it comes yeah, out. Right. It's the same way, you know, we can... We don't, you know, we don't need to. We don't need to look at words to or, or or music to sing the melody to our favorite our favorite songs. The music's already within. Now we're just pushing it through an instrument, and so it takes them a little while to, to learn that. But I, I like that the parameters. You know, I, I call it creative constraints. You know, you set up constraints, and then and then um, you know, you're, you're, like you said, you're putting them in a sandbox, and then as soon as they've they've they've, they've played in that sandbox for a while, we're going to knock one wall down. We're gonna expand it, right, <laughs> and we're gonna, exactly. you know, now you got a bigger sandbox. Add some but the whole point is, yeah, is, yeah it, but 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 the whole time trying not to let them make them feel like they're in a sandbox, you know, yeah. like just that that activity that I mentioned in the beginning. I have this thing where when I start that that thing where I was doing the C, F, and G all the way up the piano, and then on the way back I come back to E. Um, I use those four notes for a very long time, and I and it's I, I tell them I said it's not to limit you. It's to see how creative can you be using just those four notes. Yeah, yeah. How many chords could you create with just those four notes? How many different ways can we see it? Um, and that is, I think that's the other thing too, where like if you take a CF and a G and you tell them, okay, that's a C sus four chord. And again, you wouldn't do that with a beginner, but you know, a more intermediate student. Say, okay, if I put the C on the top, now it looks like an F sus two chord. So I could ask you that question, you know, and I could ask that question and you could come up with a different answer. You know, there's not, there's not one way to look at it. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's different ways to look at it. So don't worry so much about what we're calling it. What we're, that's why everything starts with the ear. Mm -hmm. Then you can go to the understanding, figuring out what you want to call it, how you want to hear it, how it's functioning in the song and things like that. And then the last part is the visual representation. You know, this is what it looks like in sheet music now. Awesome. This has been so wonderful, so inspiring, Tony. Tell us where people can find out more about you and Popmatics. Where would you like to send them? Yeah, so, well, I mean... Um, so I have, um, well, I, if, if you're interested in learning about like the Popmatics approach that I have, I, I have a group that's called Popmatics 101, um, where, where we discuss, you know, teaching, not just my method, but discuss teaching like pop stuff. Um, and you know, it's, it's a, I just started that recently, uh, over the last couple months. So it's, uh, that's a small group. And, um, and, uh, and then I also have my, uh, my studio website, which is Parlo Piano Studio. And I do have, I haven't fully like developed a, a Popmatics website yet, but if you go to popmatics.com, it'll redirect you to a page on my, um, 
on my on my studio page where I have the resources that I that I that um, I have like one package that I sell, and in there there's a link to a complimentary resource that everybody could 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 grab a copy of, and that'll actually last you that could last you a long time um, and just help you understand the system, and then from there there's links to YouTube and all that stuff, so you, you can find it from there. Fantastic! I hope people will check it out. Thank you so much for joining me today today on the Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. Tony, this me. has been awesome. We will be back here on Wednesday, everyone, with another special guest who's going to be talking about the technology side of things and websites and how we can make the most of marketing in this era. So I'm excited to be back with you then, and I'll see you all then. Bye, everyone. Bye.